Throughout human history, trails have led people across vast frontiers into conflict and resolution, compromise and harmony. Sadly, at the beginning of U.S. history, colonialism led to exploitation, slavery, and genocide. The Trail of Tears exemplifies the worst of these trends and across both geographical and ethical frontiers, in that it mandated government-sanctioned genocide to enact colonization and domination across a continent. This documentary strives to shed light on this travesty and the people it impacted. In the early 1800s, America was in its babyhood. Religious, political, and economic refugees from Europe were in the process of claiming most of a continent for themselves. With little to no regard for the people who already called it home, as white settlers began to push west further into Native American territory, not only did they begin to explore, conquer, and settle what became the Great American Frontier, but they established a new frontier of morality, showing that the United States would show blunt disregard to innocent human lives. Sadly, present throughout colonialism, both chattel slavery and the great genocide against Native Americans exemplified the way white settlers treated others. Arguably, the worst example of this approach was the Trail of Tears, when the federal government forced nearly 125,000 Native Americans to leave their homelands and walk hundreds of miles to specifically designated Indian territory across the Mississippi River in present-day Oklahoma. It's ethnic cleansing, you know, it's, it's not some trip to an amusement park. It's not something that I think we should take lightly. I think that it's genocide. Um, I think that it's it's had long lasting implications that still haunt Cherokee on both sides of the United States today. Um, it's important to remember it and know about what resulted from it, because I think that you know, it's really easy to forget that the uh, laws and legislation that we, we put forward today might actually have lived experience, lived results for people who are most at risk. Beginning in the harsh winter of 1837, the Cherokee were forcibly removed from their motherland in Tennessee, beginning a grueling forced journey across half the continent to their new government-mandated homeland Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma. The harsh terrain of unsettled land, poor planning that resulted in starvation, illnesses, exhaustion, dehydration, and death, combined with the terrible prejudicial treatment of the Native Americans by the white settlers of the time, resulting in one of the worst tragedies of all history, leaving a lasting impact on all those involved. And yet, many people have misconceptions of what really happened on the Trail of Tears, and the real historical information has been filtered by the white supremacists. Sure. Life on the Trail of Tears was horrible. Many families were forcefully removed from their homes. Soldiers in uniform did not even give them time to gather their possessions. They were lined up at gunpoint, had their weapons confiscated, and were first marched into a stockade and herded into a pen like cattle. The nights were cold in the mountains, and they did not even have enough blankets to go around. Samuel Cloud was a nine-year-old boy at the time. His family lost their home and was forced to march across the continent. Later in life, he recalled his experience to his grandson. My mother holds me at night to keep me warm. That's the only time I feel safe. I feel her pull me to her tightly. I feel her warm breath in my hair. I feel her softness as I fall asleep at night. As the days pass, more and more of our people are herded into the stockades. I see other members of my clan. Hard times fell on the Cherokee well before the first journey. The government forcibly removed them from their homes in the spring of 1838. They suffered at the hands of white settlers who seized their last remaining possessions and livestock. Federal troops and state militia simply watched by many months passed while they were held in the stockade. These crowded, filthy removal camps in Tennessee and Alabama held the Native American families until it was time to depart to the West. The government-mandated removal camps were so unhygienic that illness spread among the people, diseases such as whooping cough, measles, smallpox, typhus, and tuberculosis were uncontrollable and deadly. The Native Americans had no idea of what was going to happen to them. They heard that white men were moving into their homes 
and farming their land, and they were told to march west against their will. By the time the Native Americans departed from the removal camps, many people were weak, demoralized, and grieving loved ones who had not survived. To avoid the extreme heat of summer, most detachment weren't on the move until autumn. That decision led to Native Americans and soldiers to endure unnecessary, terrible terrain, torrential rain, deep muds, and frigid cold. The months on the Trail of Tears were more than tiring. Thousands of Cherokee, young and old, faced disease, hunger, exhaustion, and extreme weather as they traveled thousands of miles, mostly on foot. And an estimated 4,000 Cherokee died traveling to a land they did not know. It's hard to imagine today, but on December 5th, 1837, one of the first detachments of the Trail of Tears passed right by this site. They had crossed the Mississippi River into Missouri on November 12th through 13th, and their journey was plagued with illness and they were hardly able to travel. Dr. G.S. Townsend, the attending physician of the attachment, advised Cannon on November 25th to suspend travel due to the overwhelming amount of sickness prevailing amongst the group. Despite the wagons being full to capacity with the sick and dying, they camped and traveled 11 miles the next day. They traveled another 10 miles, passing by Mr. John Brinker's house before camping on his property down by the Merrimack River. It's one of, one of many um, encampment spots along the Trail of Tears um, in Missouri. We have a lot of sites across the state that we know people stayed at, but we're not quite sure um, exact locations for some of those. This is one of those that we, one of those rare ones where we do have an exact, we know that they stayed here somewhere on the property um, from this time to this time. This detachment was just the first of many detachments of Cherokee that the Brinkers bore witness to. Just over a year later, an additional 10 detachments consisting of just under 10,000 Cherokee followed in Kenneth's way. One of these detachments was conducted by Richard Taylor with the assistance of Red Wa Adair and numbered approximately 1,030 at departure. Traveling with this detachment was the Reverend Daniel Sabin Butcher and Dr. William Isaac Irwin Morrow. Both men kept journals during their travel, which are among the best source of information about the Cherokee experience along the Trail of Tears. Before the Trail of Tears, Butrick was a Christian missionary to the Cherokee back in Tennessee. He worked at Brainerd Mission in present-day Chattanooga, and him and his wife, Elizabeth, were very much against the way the Cherokee were being treated, and stood against the removal of the Indian Territory. On the journey to Indian Territory, Butrick wrote in his journal nearly every day, documenting details of the weather, conditions, surroundings, and route. Hardships and deaths that occurred en route, Buttrick wrote about the villages and towns they occurred in Missouri and was so impressed with the state that he said, the very name of Missouri conveys delight to our minds. While the Murrow Journal is the only known documentary evidence linking a Cherokee detachment to the Snelson Brinker site, it is highly likely that other detachments found a place to rest on Brinker land on their way to Indian Territory. This route, the most northern route of all three routes was one of the most grueling. Dr. Murrow had recommended, after Cannon's detachment experienced so much illness and death, that the remaining Cherokee take a steamboat over a water route instead, which would limit the risk of exhaustion and death, but few could afford to travel that way. All the surviving Cherokee eventually made it to Oklahoma by the spring of 1839, where they began to rebuild their lives and their culture. Although there were difficulties, the Cherokee adapted to their new homeland and reestablished their own system of government. Modeled on that of the United States, the new tribal government was headquartered in Tahlequah, included a constitution and elected principal chief and legislator known as the National Council. They also maintained a bilingual school system. Though the journey was imaginably hard, the Cherokee Nation is alive and well in Tahlequah today. And though the United States continued to enact racist politics as they encreached upon and settled the western frontier, few instances in history are as notably cruel, not even 200 years have passed. And it is of paramount importance that we not forget our history. Many generations have passed, and and yet Cherokee descendants still remember the Trail of Tears by riding the entire route by bicycle every summer. It is the least we can do to show our respect and honor those who have suffered and passed on the Trail of Tears. By always learning the history of our nation's decisions, good and bad, it is our hope that at the next frontier of morality we will look back on our history and move forward with more enlightenment. Oh, what a year this has been. Oh, what a sweeping wind has gone over and carried its thousands to the grave. While thousands have been tortured and scarcely survived, 
the whole nation comparatively thrown out of house and home during this dreary winter. And why? For what crime then was this whole nation doomed to perpetual death? Daniel Buttrick, January 1st, 1839.